Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more Conversations. My friend Richard Haas is again with us. For two decades, Richard has served as the iconic president of the Council on Foreign Relations, penned 12 books, and been a leading commentator on world affairs and foreign policy. Richard's Parthian shot, as he steps down from his post at the end of June, is his latest best-selling book, which isn't about foreign relations at all. It is entitled The Bill of Obligations, The Ten Habits of Good Citizens. There he makes the case that at a time in our country of deep division and anger in which we wrangle relentlessly about our rights, we must never lose sight of our common responsibilities if democracy is to work for all citizens. We're delighted to welcome Richard back to the program. Great to be back with you, Mr. Siren. Well, now, uh, Richard, before we get to the book, and we will get to the book, uh, the indictment. Everyone is talking about the indictment. You don't have it in your book because it hadn't happened when you wrote it. I mean, is that the 11th uh, obligation of citizens, the rule of law? No, the rule of law is, is just that. It's the rule of law. It's required. What I'm writing about are things that are not formally required, but things that ought to be done all the same. And indeed, a democracy assumes the rule of law, and if the rule of law is violated, we, the kinds of things you write about. We have a legal process. Uh, we have courts, and ultimately we have fines or imprisonment. I'm interested in all the things short of that, before you cross the line of legality, but still, those are behaviors that affect the quality of a democracy. I mean, talking about Mr. Trump for a second, the fact that there was no peaceful transfer of power. He did not participate in the norm of go, riding down in the limousine, down Pennsylvania Avenue, which was one of the hallmark, defining features of American democracy, then essentially encouraging people to commit sedition and violent acts in the Capitol. We'll see whether any of those things actually cross the line of law. That's what the, I'm more interested, in, you know, for what it's worth, for things that don't cross that line, but they're political and they have great consequences for our country, for our society. And the real issue for me is, will we hold people accountable politically? I'll leave it to people like you, to lawyers in the courts, to hold people accountable legally. But where do you see the intersection of law and politics? I mean, was the indictment politically a good idea or a bad idea? I think and this does not depend on what uh, the law is and what the facts are? Uh, I think this is a bad idea politically. Uh, I think it lacks a certain weight and gravitas. Uh, it will be seen as politically inspired given the person of this district attorney, given how, uh, how much crime we're seeing in, in New York. I would much prefer Mr. Trump to be indicted for crimes or to allege crimes against American democracy, vote tampering, sedition, and inciting violence, what have you. Those to me are worthy, uh, worthy charges. This is something different. I also fear Jim, this will be counterproductive. This will send the message that this is a discretionary prosecution. It is uh, politicizing uh, law in this country. So whatever you think about it, and I get it, no one's above the law. I understand the, the legal requirements here, but you're asking me politically. I think this is counterproductive. I actually think it strengthens Mr. Trump's hands of getting the Republican nomination. And if he were to get the Republican nomination, then he's one of the two people most likely to be the next president of the United States. But how could a prosecutor ever indict a former president, even if he shot people on uh, Fifth Avenue, as uh, Trump bragged he could, uh, without its being called political and a witch hunt? And it's, look, it may be called political, but I think this is where degree comes in. Uh, former presidents uh, can commit you know, crimes. And I think then you've got to ask yourself as a prosecutor, is this so clearly a crime? Has this person so clearly identified with it that I, I'm confident that if brought to trial, this person will get convicted? I'm not sure this qualifies on either. I'm not sure this is serious enough. I, and again, I, I defer to people such as yourself, whether this is a, you know, a, enough of a slam dunk or whatever awful cliche one wants to use that he is going to uh, get convicted here. So no, I don't think this rises to the level. So yeah, there's, you know, no one's above the law, but the law also takes place uh, not in a courtroom, ultimately, it takes place in the society. And I think this is a political mistake. Well, we still don't know what the precise charges are and we still don't know what the evidence is, but suppose it's followed uh, in coming weeks by uh, an indictment in Georgia for mm -hmm. tampering with the vote, uh, an indictment in Washington 
uh, for mishandling classified documents or for, uh, you put your finger on it, uh, seditious conspiracy or insurrection. Would you feel differently about it? I would. And I think the combination of the indictments and the specific content of these subsequent indictments, I think that's a different matter. Uh, I think as long as this one's sitting out there alone, it helps Mr. Trump. I'm not smart enough to know of whether you have multiple indictments and ones that are more uh, integral to the political process, whether those begin to hurt him. Maybe what will really matter is not so much the 35 percent of the, of the base that's already there for Mr. Trump. What will matter are the Republicans, both the candidates and the voters. Right now, all the candidates are rallying around Donald Trump. Well, except Asa Hutchinson. Okay, all the major candidates are rallying <laughs> around uh, Donald Trump, or the would-be major candidates. We'll see what happens if there's others. My hunch is they'll put their finger out and they'll get a sense of what the politics uh, are and whether uh, his base is still rallying with him. We'll see. I can't answer your question. But the risk is, again, to me, that this first one is counterproductive and, and strengthens him and makes it more difficult for others to attack him on the issues where he ought to be attacked, lest they appear to be somehow taking their lead from a, a progressive DA in New York. Let's move on to your book uh, <laughs> after all that. Uh, and your book is, talks about the, the habits of uh, good citizenship and to focus on habit. It's been your habit to write about foreign relations and foreign policy. And here you write a book about uh, the obligations of American citizens uh, as citizens and obligations to one another. Uh, normally we've thought of citizenship as being rights-based. We have a Bill of Rights. We have 10 rights set forth in the Constitution. Uh, now you're saying you know, not only have rights, but we have responsibilities. Now, how did you make the transition from foreign <laughs> policy to uh, the rights of citizens, and why did you do it? There's two coins I want you to envision. One is the coin of national security. On one side is all the stuff you expect me to write about, foreign policy, diplomacy, military force, sanctions, what have you. The other side of the coin, though, is our domestic situation. Our ability to set an example others in the world will want to emulate, our ability to carry out a consistent foreign policy, our ability to raise the resources for national security, all depends upon what's going on here at home. Uh, not having political gridlock, not having political violence, and so forth. So the first way I got to this is thinking that national security is not simply the province of the state and defense departments. This is, this is also national security, what happens in this society, in this uh, economy. And then secondly, my second coin, is think of citizenship as a coin with two sides. One, as you say, is rights. And indeed, we never would have had uh, the Constitution ratified were it not for the Bill of Rights. Several states said the condition on which we will ratify this proposed strengthening of the, of, the, of the government, the federal government, the executive branch, is only with a Bill of Rights. And my point is simply that rights are essential, but sooner or later, rights inevitably collide. Take one of the most emotional issues in American life, uh, abortion. The, the mother's, the woman's right to choose versus the rights of the unborn. How do, we, how do we balance that? How do we navigate that? Someone's right to have access to a gun versus someone else's right to public safety. We can go on and on. And my concern is that if we only think about rights, sooner or later those rights collide, we then again end up in either gridlock, nothing can get done, or we end up with, with, uh, with, with violence. So the other side of my citizenship coin is, is essentially obligations. Obligations that you and I and all of us have to one another as fellow citizens, as fellow members of the society, and then what all of us in the Kennedy spirit, the ask not spirit, what all of us have uh, the obligations we have to, to this country uh, uh, of ours. Let me give you, give you another way to think about it. You know, Lincoln's famous line about the unfinished work of America, spoke at Gettysburg. Uh, my point is simply just say our work gets finished and we actually do narrow the gap between our promised rights and our, and our realities, between our principles and, and reality here, even then, that doesn't guarantee American democracy works. And that's why obligations have got to be added to the mix. Rights alone do not a democracy make, certainly not one that, that, that can deliver. Well, we see uh, democracy uh, slipping all over the world. I think uh, Absolutely. some people call it backsliding. That's the, that's uh, the word of art. Uh, that's the word of art uh, for uh, um, policy wonks. Uh, Guilty. 
uh, the, uh, there's backsliding. Uh, we see it in uh, Mexico. We see it in uh, uh, Hungary. We, we even see it in Israel uh, now with trying to uh, overturn mm -hmm. uh, judicial review, uh, causing uh, thousands of people to pour into the streets and protest. Um, and uh, you see it here in America. Uh, that, uh, is that what motivated you to write the book that we may be losing our democracy? Yeah, I'm, I'm no longer sanguine about the future. Here we are, it's 2023. We're three years away from the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. To me, the lesson of the next few years is don't assume that this is necessarily going to last, or if it does last, don't assume it's going to last in the way we want it to last. I think the potential to have, I'm going to sound wonky here, forgive me, <laughs> an illiberal democracy in the United States is, is quite real, where we have the, all the institutions of a democracy, but they really don't work. They, they're not responsive to rights or obligations. They don't, they don't balance things uh, correctly. So yeah, I think the potential for that is, is real. And that, that's what motivated me, uh, a foreign policy guy, I admit it, to write this uh, book. I, I, no longer, I no longer take for granted that we're gonna be able to, to make this democracy of ours work. And what worries me if we can't, the cost we would pay as a society the cost also the world would pay, because the United States, if it can't function as it has for the last, say, what, three quarters of a century, I wonder about the domestic and international costs of a, of a failing American democracy. Well, we used to have uh, a somewhat different dialogue between uh, differing political views in America. We differed over regulation. Mm -hmm. We differed over... Uh, balanced <clears throat> budget, size of the government. Mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan said, uh, you know, government is not the solution, it's the problem. And some people agreed and some people disagreed. Uh, or a matter, it was, perhaps it was a matter of degree, not of kind. Uh, and then somehow or other we were able to reach a consensus on issues like that. And I suppose fair-minded people could reach a consensus on what the size of the federal deficit should be. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, here, and you put your finger on uh, some of the issues, uh, guns, gays, God, abortion, um, people are so dug in at the, uh, at the extreme and not moving at all. I mean, we saw it recently in the situation at Stanford Law School. Uh, I mean, is there any room for compromise? Left in America? Is there any well, the answer for is debate? The answer is there is, but one, one of my obligations is to stay open to compromise because I don't take it for, for granted. We tend to penalize those who compromise. It, it's telling that when Kennedy wrote his book, Profiling Courage. Thin book. Thin book. But he, he lauded those who compromised when to do so, put their political futures at peril or sometimes those who stayed the course and refused to. So my view is not that compromise is always right, but we should always consider it, always be, be open to it. Often now, I mean, look, we're gonna have a real test of compromise in a few months over the debt ceiling. And the question is, are people willing to compromise? And then how do the voters react to it? And what I want is to, for people to encourage politicians to compromise uh, because the consequences of not compromising, I believe, are awful. For this, uh, for this, for this economy. So at the end of the day, it's it's really up to us, the voters. We've got to get informed. My first obligation. We got to get involved. My second obligation. In this case, we have got to reward those politicians, who are willing to make intelligent compromises, and we've got to penalize those who are are unwilling to. See, at the end of the day, it's 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 kind of on us. I always say, you know, politicians cannot be counted on to be responsible. They can be counted on to be responsive. So what we have to do is put out there the incentives to act reasonably and responsibly and put out the disincentives or the penalty, penalties for those who refuse to. Well, uh, I guess going hand in hand with compromise is civility. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you, uh, it's, it's really hard to achieve compromise when uh, each side is savaging the other. Yeah. Uh, and you see it now with uh, the indictment with uh, uh, Trump uh, calling uh, uh, District Attorney Bragg uh, uh, an animal and, uh, uh, and savaging him, saying he's a, a psychopath and uh, a degenerate. Um, and you have, it's not only Trump, it's uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene goes on television and talks about, and is unchallenged, yep. when she talks about Democrats being pedophiles. And, uh, I saw that. Uh, Look, I think 
civility is valuable. You know, arguments don't get better if you're uncivil. If you shout, if you disparage, if you, if you make ad hominem attacks, in my experience, it doesn't improve the quality of your argument. And also, if one is uncivil today, how in the world are you supposed to be able to work with somebody on another issue tomorrow? Incivility actually has real, has real consequences. It's one of the things that leads to, to breakdown in our, in our politics. I think, again, voters have to reward civility, have to penalize the opposite, and others in our society should speak up. How about religious leaders? More, you know, hundreds, you know, more than 100 million Americans every week go to a house of worship, to a church, a synagogue, a mosque. So religious, the numbers are falling down. They are falling, but they're still pretty high. So where are religious leaders? I'm not asking them to take a stance on the issues, on the debt ceiling, but it seems to me religious leaders, people with moral authority, can be expected to speak up and talk about civility to talk about nonviolence, to talk about reaching out uh, to, to others, to listening to them, not, not attacking them personally simply because you, you disagree, to be open to compromise. This is what we expect from, from the clergy. This is all consistent with scripture. The idea of looking out for your fellow American, the idea of being your brother's or sister's keeper. These are not crazy ideas. This is, this is embedded in scripture. Where are our religious authorities? Why are they abdicating their responsibility? Well, uh, that's a good question, and it sort of leads us into another area, which is education, uh, particularly, uh, I mean, education in this country, we see it more and more. It's become politicized. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, become weaponized. Uh, we can't teach children about uh, Rosa Parks and who she was and what she stood for uh, because it's uh, deemed critical race theory. Uh, and uh, what can be done to reform the educational system unless it's done by citizens and done by parents? Uh, and well, the good news is there's not one system. So at the university level, I think there's a lot of scope. Uh, all these private colleges and, and universities, tremendous scope there. My goal is no one should be able to graduate from one without being exposed to civics. I think it's outrageous that you can graduate from more than 90% of America's colleges and universities without having taken a basic course about American democracy and what it requires of citizens to make it work. At the state level, a little bit more complicated because of state funding, certainly in some states like Florida, but you still have religious schools, you still have private schools, you still have chartered schools. In many states, you have a more open political environment. So the change can be introduced there. And again, one could have civics, the basics of American government and so forth, many of the things we're talking about. Obligations can be, can be uh, discussed. Also, New Jersey has just passed a law, Governor Murphy signed into law, of information literacy. The whole idea of teaching young people, how do you navigate this flood of information? How do you know a fact when you see one? How do you know when something that purports to be a fact is not? Where do you go? How do you multi-check you know, your, your sources of, of, of information and so forth? What, what is good technique, so to speak, uh, rules of thumb for navigating uh, the internet? So that's the kind of thing also we could teach uh, in high schools. It doesn't teach people what to think. God forbid, what it teaches them is how to be a critical consumer. That's something that I would think there's a good chance of getting many states to adopt. Or how to think. Well, you uh, sort of brushed on uh, the new phenomenon, which is uh, social media and the internet. And uh, people live in a political bubble. They tend to mm -hmm. uh, go on Facebook and what's in the feed. It's something that's constant with uh, what sure. somebody thinks uh, some some guy uh, who knows algorithms thinks uh, the political views, and they get it again and again and again, right. and uh, without thinking. I mean, how do we overcome that? I look. You're the lawyer. I'm not. The Supreme Court had several days of oral arguments recently about the Decency Act of '96. I think it is. They're looking at so-called Section 230. I'm skeptical. They're going to come down with a ruling that's going to hold uh, the companies that provide the pipeline, the pipe, so to speak. Uh, liable or responsible for content. I don't think Congress is going to wade into that space. So I end up saying it's probably going to be up to consumers. And that's where, again, teaching people about information literacy might be really important. But look, I think it's nuts that people go to social media, TikTok, Facebook. 
Uh, these are not edited or authenticated or gate, gate, you know, there's no gatekeepers in these uh, places. It's called social media for a reason. It's not called serious media, media. It's not called factual media. It's called social media. Well, what, what the hell do people expect they're, they're going to get? So that's why it's so important, I think, to teach young people. That's fine to go to for fun up to a point. So again, a lot of the content in these places is not, is not fine if one looks at something like, like TikTok, but that can't be a substitute for access to dependable sources of, of, uh, of information. And we, we have got to teach that. It's also, by the way, what you were getting at, that everybody lives in his or her own bubble, information ecosystem. I think you're right. It's one of the things, one of the reasons I'm so in favor of public service. I want to get people out, so I, I worry that's that that's another obligation. Another obligation, not I, only to serve, but also to have respect for others who serve, and because they're so they're doing something for us that we're not doing for ourselves. Absolutely, and all of us are affected by government. So instead of being anti-government, we should be pro-improving government where it needs to be uh, improved, and we want people to have some common experiences in this country. So why are we uh, vilifying the deep state, demonizing the FBI, defunding the police, well, or funding the police uh, because uh, uh, so there'll be more jail terms? Because it's an easy, cheap shot politically, uh, and even you, know, you mentioned Reagan before. You know, criticize. You know, people love to criticize government. I always try to remind people, is that before or after you collect your social security check? Before or after you go to the doctor, which is your, it's paid for by, by Medicare or, or Medicaid? Is that before or after you dial 911 and you get the fire department or the police department? The government's us. This idea of a deep state is preposterous. We ought not to vilify it again. Where it's not good, government makes mistakes all the time. My reaction is make it better. Get the best and the brightest to want to go into government. I agree a lot of the best and brightest aren't going into government. I worry about it in my field, in foreign policy. I don't see that happening. So my goal is what, what would it take to get the smartest young people, not necessarily to go to Silicon Valley or Goldman Sachs, how do we get them to go into the State Department or the Pentagon or something like that? I actually think that would be good for this country. Well, one way is to honor their service and not uh, I agree. Uh, deprecate it. And uh, we have that with the military as well because, of course, Trump took on, uh, what was it, a gold star parent, and he took on John McCain. Uh, no, Donald people. Trump was almost like the, you know, the Will Rogers. He, ne he never met a norm <laughs> he, would, uh, he, uh, well, he, he would like. He never met, met a man he liked, except... Uh, well, he never met a norm he wouldn't violate. And, you know, by, the way, by the way, you left out in, uh, in, the, in your dialogue uh, Sarah Huckabee, who was opposed to uh, government but didn't mind taking money for tornado relief in a state, so, so... So then one has to point out the hypocrisy of it and just remind people, this is up to other politicians, it's up to the media, to basically say, hey, all you anti-government people, stop for a second. There's 25 million Americans who work at state, federal, or local uh, government. Government includes the military, the all-volunteer force, and includes all these other people on the public payroll. We can't be against them. Those are our neighbors. Those, those are our brothers and sisters in some cases, literally. So I, I think we need to call people out when they talk about it. And where government is unresponsive or where government is doing things that ought not to, well, fine. That's why Congress is meant to have hearings. That's why we have inspectors general. It's ironic that so many of the people who call, were critical of the so-called deep state were also undermining the strength of inspectors general. The inconsistency, the, the hypocrisy here, shall we say, is at times overwhelming. Well, that is very interesting. Uh, so uh, have we left out any of the important obligations because we've really scaled the rock over the pond well, of this marvelous book you've written? We've gotten most of them. I, I don't have my cheat sheet with me, but we've, we've gotten uh, most of them. The only one I'd leave out is probably the last and the ultimate one, which is the idea of putting country before party or, or person. In some ways, it's almost like the 10th Amendment. It's the catch-all. And this is the, the catch-all where all these things add up to that, that our obligation is to put country first. We saw it recently with some of these secretaries of state who stood by the integrity of an electoral process, even if it meant their own party lost, even if threats to their own person. I would say Liz Cheney showed real uh, courage in that sense and put the country before her own political uh, future. And it's up to us as voters to reward it. Okay, we, so you dedicate your book, actually, to those people who put uh, the Constitution and the country above yes, self-interest, and uh, that was moving that you did that. Uh, but all right, so now you're about to step down from your post, so I have a yes, question sir. for you, Richard Haas. Yes, You've sir, been Jim's with Iron. us so many times, and you'll be with us so many more times. If you'll have But me. what is 
your view of your legacy at the Council on Foreign Relations and uh, what do you see uh, that you have learned over the past uh, 10 years, which has been a fluid, and, uh, 20, years, 20 years, which has been a fluid and evolving situation? Look, what, whenever you, you, if you're fortunate enough to get the job I had, which is to be president of the Council on Foreign Relations, this is a legacy institution. And the tension or the dilemma whenever you, you're given responsibility for a legacy institution is to balance uh, preservation with innovation. And I think the danger is you don't change it enough and it gets stayed and tired or you change it too much and you lose what makes it special. So I've tried to get that balance right. I'll leave it to others such as yourself to judge, but I think I've done uh, okay at it. What I feel best about in the innovation department is what we've done over the last 10 or 12 years is to take foreign policy to people who are normally not in the foreign policy conversation. We have now become the leading educator in the country about the world. So I feel great that we've protected the independence and integrity of this institution, this nonpartisan institution in a polarized time. But I also feel really good that we've made it much more relevant to a much larger number of Americans. That if I had a single out one thing. That's what I feel best about. More relevant to a large number of Americans. Well, I give you a robust here, here. Thank you, sir. And thank you for coming by. And thank you so much for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. Uh, I'm Jim Zirin.